Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to our video series on introductory syntax. I want to apologize a little bit for uh, the delay in the production of these videos. Um, I had a little bit of technical issues. Um, the webcam I've been using was not uh, communicating very well with the software that I used to record the videos. Uh, had to get that sorted out, um, and you know it's a little difficult right now to like go to IT and do all of that stuff. So uh, that took a little bit of time, and then I also uh, occasionally suffer from migraines, and those sort of started rearing their head, and so it just sort of slowed me down. Um, so um, I fell a little bit behind on things, but um, picking things back up and getting things going again. So. Here we are. Um, today, uh, it's going to be a relatively short video. Um, we're going to talk about the passive, uh, which is uh, what I uh, said we were going to talk about last time. And that's going to integrate uh, both uh, what we were talking about with our DP movement and our head movement. Um, and we're going to talk uh, about two different ways of dealing with the passive. Uh, we're going to talk about a uh, the the sort of analysis that is presented in the Carney textbook, and we're going to talk about a different analysis um, that is uh, 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 kind of an, an approach that's somewhat more aligned with the uh, uh, morpheme lowering analysis that I talked about with with head movement. Uh, not, it's not one that you have to adopt, even if you take a lowering analysis, um, but it is uh, one that uh, uh, sort of offers some explanation as to uh, some of the, the things that we know about the passive. Uh, this is uh, uh, particularly associated with the, the linguist Mark Baker. Um, the, so the, the facts about what a passive is. Uh, of course, the passive is really famous for being, uh, you know, something that kind of prescriptive linguists don't like. So we should, you know, kind of make clear on what we're talking about when we talk about the passive. So uh, what is the passive? So we can take a, a simple declarative sentence like the police arrested John and uh, John was arrested. And sentence two here, John was arrested, is an example of a passive. And the way we uh, can look at a passive is that we can see certain attributes of the relationship between uh, the 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 um, declarative sentence and the uh, the passive sentence. In particular, uh, there is a difference in the number of arguments, the number of noun phrases that are associated with the verb. Um, uh, so the uh, Subject, uh, the understood subject of the sentence in the declarative is removed or included in an optional by phrase. So we can say John was arrested by the police, though this is a little bit awkward. Um, uh, and the understood object is promoted into that subject position. But the theta uh, or thematic roles of these sentences, of these arguments, remain. Now, uh, in many prescriptive uh, grammatical traditions, you're going to see discussions of uh, sort of passive that talk about sort of passive verbs that are not talking about this type of relation. And that's really not what we don't care about that. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the passive. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is, the, you know, the sort of classic uh, 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 handbook of um, 
uh, you know, how to write well. Um, and I'm, of course, blanking on it right off, off the top of my head as I try to produce this video. Um, Strunk and White. Uh, Strunk and White talk about the passive. And they, they, they are one of the classic examples of, avoid, of trying to avoid the passive in writing. And uh, uh, they provide four examples of passives that are, are said to be bad. Uh, but three out of the four are, in fact, not grammatical passives. Um, now, the passive can be overused in writing. Um, it can be, uh, it's often a, a sign of sort of, uh, uh, especially of novice writers trying to sound more technical. Um, but it can also be a very useful, uh, tool, uh, when we're trying to sort of demote the importance of, uh, of a subject. Uh, so for instance, if we take this sentence, uh, the police arrested John, well, that's kind of a strange sentence to utter. The police arrested John. Well, of course, the, the police are kind of the things that do arresting. So uh, it would be much more, uh, a much more uh, informationally coherent way to utter that sentence would be to say the passive John was arrested. Uh, because the important thing to highlight there is John. He was the one that was arrested. And so that's typically why we use the passive is that we want to emphasize the importance of that object. Uh, a lot of English teachers will say it's because we're wanting to hide the, um, the, 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 the fact that the, um, the subject did something. And that can be the case. But more often than not, it, it's just because there's a conventional meaning. Um, I mean, the police are the types of people that do arresting. And so we just don't need to to express it. Um, it, it so there's informational structure that, that goes along with this. That's getting kind of beyond our discussion. Um, I do want to talk uh, very briefly before we get into our uh, the actual analysis of the passive. Uh, passives are really important in the history of linguistic theory. So there is a whole series of, uh, there's a, a great book you can read called The Linguistic Wars. Uh, but this um, goes back into the, the late 60s, early 70s. There was a period in linguistic theory where uh, uh, folks were really concerned about where is meaning housed in relation to syntax. Um, and, you know, again, we're thinking about a model of knowledge and we're thinking about um, a model of, and so this is not to say that we're, we don't know what we're going to, to, to say or mean before we start speaking, because this is not a model of, of speech. This is a model of knowledge. Um, and so in the, in the late 1960s, uh, early 1970s, uh, a group of um, linguists known as the generative semanticists said that meaning is the input to syntax. And uh, one of the critical elements of the, uh, that sort of helped us clarify what all of this, what was happening here was the passive. And, and I'm trying to remember if I've talked about these sentences before. It's, as I've said, it's been a minute since I've done these videos. But one of the things we saw with these is um, that the passive can interfere with actual meaning. So if we take a sentence like beavers build dams, this sentence is true of our world and it's a sentence about beavers. Um, so it, 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 it's kind of saying, well, you know, it's generally true of beavers that they build dams. Um, but what is not true is the passive sentence. Dams are built by beavers. And what's critical about this for a theory of knowledge that says that meaning happens before any syntax is that these two sentences should be meaningfully equivalent, and they're clearly not. 
So this sentence and this sentence are not equivalent, obviously, because this one is a sentence about beavers, this one is a sentence about dams, and um, they just don't mean the same thing. So obviously meaning is computed in some way after syntax, um, and that's important for us. And again, this, this kind of falls for us out of the fact that, that we're building a theory of knowledge. We're not necessarily building a theory of sort of processing, production, and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about um, our integration of how the passive works. Um, and again, I want to present two models of this. Um, I want to start with the Carney model because it's the easier model. Um, and that is simply that we're just going to have a selectional relation between a passive was and a verb. And, um, and then that is going to, uh, uh, uh and th there's going to be sort of that verb is just itself going to be a passive, um, it's going to kind of fail in some ways in a in a um, in an explanatory way, but it it, it it'll work for us. So we'll use our uh, John and uh, the arrested case. So we're going to have a VP. John, meet down low. Oh, I messed that up. So I'm going to start off by looking at this VP down here. Um, this VP is going to be somewhat different than the VPs we've seen before insofar as it will still assign a theta role. But it's not going to assign accusative case. And the reason it's not going to assign accusative case is because it's going to have a selectional relationship with another V was, which is going to have there, this was is going to have sort of a passive requirement down here. And this passive is basically going to say, you don't have accusative case to give out. This still follows from what uh, we talked about before, which is Bertzio's generalization, which is that if you don't have an external argument, you don't have accusative case to assign. So this is uh, passive. This is also in the Carney text why there's this sort of relation, uh, why the, the, the case is what it is, or the, the morphology is what it is down here. And this will be a VP. And then we'll layer on top of that a uh, T bar and a TP. There should be a CP all the way on top of this, but I've run out of board space. Um, so what's going to happen from this is we're going to raise was into our T position. And John will raise into the spec specifier of TP position. Now, it may also stop off in all of these um, specifier of, of V positions that are available. We'll talk about that more in, uh, later. Uh, but it needs to raise here for EPP 
and case positions, case reasons, because this T uh, is a tense T. This is this is past, and so it receives both its nominative case and it f f satisfies the EPP of this this higher T. Um, so that's how it, it essentially works in the Carney text. Um, I want to talk about an alternative account, which is, um, again, this is an account, uh, I would not say it's uh, a contemporary account, but it gives us a little bit more um, of an explanation as to what's happening. Um, and it works with the uh, lowering account that we, we talked about last time. Uh, so it's going to be much the same structurally. So we're going to build, oh, this red marker is starting to run out. We're going to build a, I'm just going to draw a, a, the tree from the top down, or at least build the layers of the, t of the tree from the top down. I'm just gonna I'm gonna cheat a little bit. Put our passive was here because we're gonna lower stuff. Was plus E N V P V bar V. Okay, so the main difference here is now whether or not was en starts as in the, the t position or starts in a in uh, intermediate v position, we can discuss um, uh, or we can think about. But I'm just going to put it in a higher t position because uh, this is gonna it's going to end up lowering, or at least a piece of it's going to lower. So was this en here is going to lower. And it lowers down into ened. It, when it meets up with arrest, it's going to become arrested. And it, it's a special sort of morpheme. It's a special, it's, it does more than just uh uh add on this morphology it actually because of its relationship with this passive um it is going to absorb the agent theta role and the accusative case so this is a little strange but basically it is functioning as the uh, a pseudo agent um so that's really the the role of this sort of passive in this in this case is that it is going down here and this passive morphology is going up and sort of eating up these two things john which i left the n off of uh still gets the um uh the the theta role that it um, would get here, the thematic theta role, um, but it now is in a position where it is still needing to receive case. So structurally, these two uh, analyses are very similar. So it is going to end up raising into the specifier of T just as it did before. So the, the two explanations are very, very similar. The core element here, is the core differences are um, how the arguments, how the, the, um, the agent theta role disappears and how the um, accusative case disappears. So that's really the, the fundamental difference between these two explanations. But 
fundamentally the operations are the same. The uh, uh, understood uh, uh, object needs to raise to the subject position um, and there's some sort of special morphology that appears on the main verb. So that's the passive uh, in a nutshell. Um, for our next video, we will look at uh, how to form how to form a WH question. Um, so that's going to integrate both the head movement with the uh, yes no questions that we looked at, and then um, a, a new form of movement, which is referred to as either a bar movement or WH movement. Um, as I've done before, I want to leave with a uh, uh, some sort of philosophy or a saying from something. Uh, this time I'm pulling from a fictional work. Uh, this is from uh, uh, The Lord of the Rings by uh, Tolkien. Um, so uh, uh, I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. So I hope all of you are being safe and healthy and um, trying to do um, the best that you can with uh, the strange and unusual circumstances that we're all in. And I uh, hope to be back recording these videos very soon and see you all very soon. All right. Thank you.